The fashion industry is one of the most romanticized and ruthless markets out there. With the retail apocalypse in the early 2000s and the rise of fast fashion, most brands have succumbed to the idea that the only way to generate profits nowadays is to slash prices, compromise on quality, and pump out as many new products as online shoppers can scroll through. But throughout the chaos, there's one product that remains immune to these challenges. Eyewear. From sunglasses to prescription lenses, eyewear has gone from a product that was long shunned by most brands to a burgeoning subsector of the industry that has become an extension of our style, personality, and even status. While most other categories in the clothing industry continue to struggle, profit margins across major eyewear brands are fat and healthy, driven by prices that have never been higher. Today, Ray-Ban's most popular model starts at $270. For Oakley's, it's $230. Add prescription lenses to those and you're looking at spending upwards of $500. It's a puzzling dynamic for a product that amounts to nothing more than a couple pieces of plastic, screws, and glass. But the reality behind this anomaly lies with one company, Luxottica, a company whose reach is as vast as it is invisible to the average shopper. Today, nearly 1.4 billion people around the world wear Luxottica glasses, many doing so without even knowing it. Over the years, the company has grown to control over 80% of major eyewear brands, from popular labels like Ray-Ban and Oakley's to high-end names like Prada, Versace, and Chanel. It's an impressive feat for a company that doesn't even put its own logo on a single pair of glasses it sells, a fundamental lack of self-promotion that contradicts most other consumer brands that plaster their logo across every single one of their products and ad spots they can get their hands on. But the lack of awareness surrounding Luxottica is very much by design, a feature that was instilled by its founder, Leonardo Del Vecchio, a man who earned the moniker Mr. Nobody for the mystery that surrounded him and his company. The business model that Leonardo carefully curated at Luxottica is an enigma, defying much of conventional business logic. Despite only costing around $30 to make, Luxottica manages to sell its glasses at nearly 10 times their cost. In most markets, margins that high would be unsustainable and would eventually get competed away once new players entered the market and drove down prices. However, a similar dynamic has failed to play out in this industry. Just in the last few years, Warby Parker was lauded for the disruptive potential of their direct-to-consumer eyewear business which allowed customers to buy ultra-low-cost glasses that they could try on from the comfort of their home. The idea turned out to be a hit among storied Silicon Valley venture capitalists, with the company going on to raise hundreds of millions of dollars from some of the biggest names in the Valley and eventually debut on the New York Stock Exchange at a $6.8 billion valuation. But in the months that followed, their optimism was met with reality. Revenue projections were recalculated, growth forecasts were downgraded, and the company went on to lose nearly 75% of its market value. In parallel, Luxottica had its most profitable year in company history, pulling in just over $16 billion in profits. So how is it that one company has managed to amass such a significant grip over its industry? In this episode, we'll examine the rise of Luxottica and study the chess moves that its founder orchestrated to establish Luxottica as the uncontested monopoly provider of glasses around the world. For the longest time, glasses were not the chic fashion accessory that they are today. Instead, glasses were seen as a medical device, something that was only worn out of sheer necessity, an emblem of physical imperfection that often carried a certain degree of social stigma. Because of this, the eyewear industry was historically relegated to the back burner when it came to business priorities of consumer-oriented brands. Unlike the glamorous world of fashion or luxury watches, glasses were seen as a second-rate product that lacked the allure needed to attract top-tier designers and manufacturers. Instead, the production of glasses was typically outsourced to a sprawling network of subcontractors. It was here where Luxottica's origin story kicks off. During the 1960s, Leonardo found a job working as an apprentice at a small metal shop in the Italian Alps in his early 20s, spending his days assembling various components into frames that would eventually go on to become prescription lenses. The design of these frames reflected the utilitarian view that the industry had of glasses. Frames were constructed from basic materials such as metal or simple plastics, and the range of available colors was equally unimaginative, typically restricted to blacks, browns, or metallic hues. But soon the cultural perception of eyewear reached an inflection point. With the increasing democratization of television and other new forms of media, Hollywood icons and celebrities helped reinvent eyewear as a new form of consumer self-expression. Aviators emanated the confidence and swagger of Tom Cruise and Top Gun. Round frames worn by John Lennon and Steve Jobs symbolized creativity and the countercultural movement in the 1960s, while franchises like Men in Black, Matrix, and The Terminator popularized the mysteriousness of all black frames. 
it was an emerging trend that Leonardo saw firsthand and decided to use as a launching pad, quitting his job to pursue his own eyewear venture that he named Luxottica. But Leonardo opted to take a different approach to the manufacturing of his glasses. Unlike the rest of the industry, who had historically outsourced the entirety of their production to small metal shops like his former employer, Leonardo envisioned a company where every stage of production, from the initial design sketch to the final delivery of a polished pair of glasses, was managed in-house. So he invested heavily in R&D, developing automated molding machines that helped speed up production, and adopted electroplating techniques that jewelers had typically used when making high-end jewelry to coat his frames with more durable metals and increase longevity. It's a concept that might seem obvious in today's day and age of fully vertically integrated companies, but at the time it was a business model that seemed foolish to Leonardo's competitors, who couldn't see the sense in investing in production efficiencies for a product that was so commercially unattractive. But Leonardo's investment gave him a significant cost advantage over his competitors, allowing him to offer his first set of optical frames to his customers at a far lower price than his competitors. But despite this early success, one fundamental truth stood in his way. Despite Leonardo's best efforts to reinvent the industry's stale business model, he couldn't ignore the fact that in the eyes of the average Joe, his glasses were nearly indistinguishable from those offered by his competitors, nothing more than a simple commodity that could be sold at commodity-level prices. What Leonardo needed was a competitive advantage of sorts, something that he could offer that none of his competitors could, allowing him to justify a higher price tag and capture higher margins. The solution to his predicament was branding, figuring that if customers associated a greater value with his glasses, they would be more inclined to pay a higher price for them. The problem was that the Luxottica brand hardly carried the type of brand cachet that he needed. Instead, he approached major fashion houses, proposing a partnership arrangement to manufacture sunglasses and prescription lenses that carried their logo in exchange for a licensing fee. In theory, it was a win-win for both parties. Luxury fashion houses that didn't have the expertise to manufacture glasses could expand their revenue in a risk-free way, earning their royalty fee only if Leonardo's idea was successful. But most fashion houses didn't see it that way, fearing that associating their namesake with a product that was seen more as a crutch rather than a desirable piece of fashion that could complement their catalog of luxury clothing would diminish their brand equity. But Leonardo finally found a company that was willing to take a chance on the idea when he met with Giorgio Armani signing his first licensing agreement with the luxury menswear brand in the late 1980s. Shortly thereafter, Luxottica launched a line of Armani eyewear that retailed for as high as $400. The idea quickly took hold with consumers. For shoppers who weren't able to afford the $1,000 price tags on Armani's famous clothing, a pair of Armani glasses offered a value proposition that allowed them to associate themselves with a brand that signaled influence and wealth without totally breaking the bank. And after the initial proof of concept with Armani took off, It was a playbook that Leonardo repeated with many other European fashion brands who gradually came around to Leonardo's proposal, going on to establish licensing agreements with some of the most famous brands like Chanel, Prada, Versace, Burberry, and Polo Ralph Lauren. It was a competitive advantage that sparked Luxottica's revenues to take off, soaring to $500 million by 1994. But Leonardo was playing a dangerous game. The success of his licensing model hinged entirely on perception an illusion of sorts that would only work if customers truly believed that they were buying Armani glasses and not Luxottica glasses. In turn, he had to make sure that his company kept a low profile, ensuring that Luxottica operated with complete discretion, knowing full well that customers would be far less likely to pay $400 for a pair of glasses if they found out that they weren't actually being made by the same skilled artisans who made $15,000 Chanel bags or $10,000 Armani suits and instead were actually being produced in a completely separate factory and bore no actual relations to these brands beyond the logo that was stamped onto their frames before being shipped to stores and put on display for sale. But while Leonardo made sure Luxottica kept a low profile in public, he took a completely different approach when it came to his business dealings behind closed doors. Over the next decade, Leonardo leveraged the funds that his licensing deals generated to pursue a series of hostile acquisitions that sent shockwaves across corporate boardrooms. Although Luxottica enjoyed some early success by selling glasses through the luxury brands that had signed on to the licensing arrangement, Leonardo was still reliant on their retail storefronts to manage the actual sale. So in 1995, Leonardo issued a $1.1 billion offer to buy U.S. Shoe Corporation, a holding company that sold footwear and apparel through a web of subsidiaries. Despite the company's thoroughly unimaginative name, 
It owned what would be an immensely valuable asset to Luxottica's business model, LensCrafters, the largest optical retail chain in the U.S., which sold a third of all eyewear across the country. On paper, Luxottica's offer was laughable. From a valuations perspective, U.S. shoe was worth nearly five times more than Luxottica. But Leonardo managed to line up a series of investment banks that agreed to finance the transaction. But the deal quickly turned hostile when the company rejected his offer. Leonardo, however, ever the cunning and scheming dealmaker, lobbied to oust the conglomerate's board of directors in order to bring in a group of more friendly executives who would be more favorable to his offer. And when the deal finally closed, Leonardo moved quickly to strip the company for parts, selling off all the company's assets until all that remained was the LensCrafter brand. Next, Leonardo began pumping Luxottica's sunglasses and prescription lenses through LensCrafters, replacing shelves that had previously been filled with his competitors' products with his own. It was a dramatic consolidation of product offerings that's tough to overstate. In 1995, the year Luxottica acquired LensCrafters, only 5% of LensCrafter sales came from Luxottica products. But by 1996, it jumped to 43%, and in 2002, it was 76%. Today, over 90% of LensCrafter sales comes from selling Luxottica glasses. And just as he had done with his licensing deals, Leonardo used this playbook to amass a portfolio of retail chains that included Sunglass Hut, Pearl Vision, Target Optical, and Sears Optical. By 2011, Luxottica's retail footprint grew to include over 9,000 stores, giving the brand complete domination over the customer shopping experience. Carefully selecting where products were placed in the stores, making sure that Luxottica glasses had the optimal placement where they could benefit from the most foot traffic from passing shoppers and ensure that customers made their purchasing decision before ever even getting near to the aisles that showcase competitors' brands. But while Leonardo's strategy funneled customers to Luxottica glasses, his ability to capture value from his string of acquisitions was limited by the royalty fees he had to pay fashion houses every time he sold a pair of glasses that donned their logo. Maximizing the value of his sizable retail presence required that Luxottica manufactured products for an eyewear brand that it owned outright. And in 1999, Leonardo found the ideal candidate, Ray-Ban. It was a brand that epitomized the cultural significance that glasses had captured, with numerous celebrities and movie stars donning the company's iconic designs like the Wayfarer, Aviators, and Clubmasters. But despite its cultural success, the brand had been poorly managed, cheapened by overproduction and flimsy build quality, which saw the brand selling its iconic frames at gas stations, convenience stores, and discount retailers for as little as $20. So Leonardo scooped up the brand for a cool $650 million and quickly integrated it into Luxottica's well-oiled manufacturing and distribution ecosystem. Under Leonardo's control, Luxottica not only increased the brand's quality, but dramatically reduced the supply of glasses being sold. Repositioning Ray-Bans as a hot commodity that consumers quickly became intrigued with now that they were much more difficult to come by. And with the brand's newfound demand solidified, Leonardo began steadily raising the brand's price tag. In 2000, a year after Luxottica acquired Ray-Bans, a pair of its famous aviators retailed for $79, but by 2002 it was $90, and by 2009 it was $130, and today, those same glasses start at $171. The trend was emblematic of Luxottica's grip on the industry. With the acquisition of Ray-Ban, Luxottica had established a competitive moat that was practically impenetrable by competitors. Not only did it own the majority of retail locations where glasses were sold, it now wielded the power of a flagship brand that it could funnel through its network of retail locations to maximize Ray-Ban's market potential. It revealed a major competitive threat for competing brands, especially for those that still relied on Luxottica's network of retail stores for their own sales. One of those competing brands was Oakley. Despite Ray-Ban's dominance as the most popular brand among consumers in the early 2000s, Oakley was hot on the brand's heels. While Ray-Ban had long positioned its glasses as timeless models for the masses, Oakley had carved out a niche in the market among extreme sports enthusiasts and sold glasses that matched the adrenaline-seeking nature of its target market. Unlike most other brands at the time, Oakley glasses were unapologetically bold and provocative, designed to be a statement piece that would draw attention and turn heads. And with customers increasingly looking to push the boundaries of what eyewear could be, the brand quickly surpassed the sports world and began releasing iconic models like the Sub-Zeros, Eye Jackets, Frog Skins, and Razor Blades, which became a mainstay in popular culture, featured in Hollywood blockbusters and donned by A-list celebrities, fueling the company's sales, which grew to reach $400 million by 2001. 
But as a brand that had a limited direct-to-consumer presence, Oakley relied heavily on retail chains like Sunglass Hut, which accounted for 30% of Oakley's annual sales. But after Luxottica acquired Sunglass Hut in 2001, executives at Oakley's panicked, fearing the level of control that Luxottica would have over its company. Fears that soon proved to be justified when Luxottica, hungry to juice profit margins at Sunglass Hut, demanded that Oakley reduce the wholesale price it charged at stores to stock Oakley products. But executives at Oakley refused, confident that the company's position as the second most popular glasses brand gave them some type of protection from being pushed around like lesser brands. Instead, Oakley executives sent over a counteroffer that was still a sizable cut to their profit margins, but came in at a lower terms than the initial demand set by Luxottica. But Leonardo wasn't interested in negotiating and simply cut purchase orders for Oakley glasses. It was a strategically cutthroat maneuver. As a public company, Oakley was legally obligated to inform its investors that it would miss its earnings projections because its largest sales channel had effectively been turned off overnight. And once the news came out, Oakley's investors panicked, causing Oakley's stock price to plummet 40%, wiping $500 million from the company's market valuation. The move forced Oakley's back to the negotiating table with its tail between its legs, quickly agreeing to Luxottica's original demands in order to stabilize its collapsing stock price. But with Oakley's reliance on Sunglass Hut exposed to the world, Leonardo saw an opportunity to capitalize on the brand's vulnerability. Leonardo instructed his designers at Ray-Ban to start releasing glasses that were eerily reminiscent of Oakley's top-selling models, pretty much carbon copying Oakley's iconic ice and emerald-colored shades. And despite a series of lawsuits launched by Oakley, Luxottica had dealt a crushing blow to Oakley's commercial prospects. Because at the end of the day, customers who walk into Sunglass Hut could care less what type of corporate power struggles were going on between Ray-Ban and Oakley. All they cared about was finding the style of sunglasses that they wanted. Although many might have entered Sunglass Hut with Oakley's in mind, what they were really after was the aesthetic and design that Oakley offered. So when presented with Ray-Bans that echoed the same design language, combined with prime in-store placement and subtle nudges from sales staff, Oakley's quickly became an afterthought to unassuming customers. It put Oakley in an increasingly vulnerable position and marked the first time in company history that its profit growth had stalled. And despite scrambling to establish its own brick-and-mortar presence and diversify away from Sunglass Hut, it was too little, too late. So with Oakley having been starved from accessing its customer base, Leonardo extended his own version of an olive branch and offered to acquire the company for $2 billion in 2007. In an ironic turn of events, Oakley's had been pushed into a corner with nowhere else to run except into the arms of their greatest rival, reluctantly accepting Leonardo's offer. In later years, when a Luxottica executive was pressed about the deal, it was tough to conceal that the entire saga had been nothing more than a calculated chess move that had been strategically orchestrated by Leonardo all along. There were some issues between the two companies in uh, the beginning of the 2000s, but both of them understood that it was better to go along better to let you buy them? Uh, I wouldn't say this. We merged with Oakley in 2007. You bought so Oakley. We're talking they tried to compete and they lost and then you bought them. I understand your theory, but they understood that life was better together. As consumers were drawn to the notion of choice, knowing that the power that we as consumers have when choosing to buy one product over another has material impacts on a company's bottom line is empowering. It's the reason shoppers have come to expect good customer service and are quick to return products that don't live up to their promises. But if you walk into a Sunglass Hut or any other retail chain owned by Luxottica today, that power that consumers think they have is really just an illusion of choice. Unlike conventional retail spaces where brands are constantly pitted against one another, vying for the customer's attention based on price or quality, Luxottica has designed a shopping ecosystem that allows it to operate without even a trace of these competitive pressures. Instead, the average shopper who's trying to decide between a pair of sunglasses from Ray-Ban or Oakley is completely unaware of the fact that ultimately, it doesn't matter which pair they buy. Regardless of their final choice, Luxottica is the ultimate beneficiary. The financial gain, no matter the brand selected, funnels directly into Luxottica's pockets. And that dynamic has tons of downstream consequences. Any aspiring up-and-coming eyewear brand has to get into Luxottica's retail chains if it wants to get in front of shoppers. But the profit margins that Luxottica needs to earn to justify stocking brands outside of its ecosystem has to at least meet, if not exceed, those that they generate from selling their own brands. Otherwise, they'd make more money by just displaying another pair of Ray-Bans or Oakley's instead. As a result, it just doesn't make economic sense to enter this market. 
knowing that your margins will always be a fraction of what they really could be. And while you could argue that's why brands like Warby Parker are trying to cut out Luxottica and push an online, direct-to-consumer approach, the market just doesn't support that model. One of the really unique dynamics about the eyewear market is that most purchasing decisions are made in person, where customers have the freedom to try on hundreds of different frames in order to find the exact model that fits their face shape and other preferences. It's a market that's uniquely resistant to any form of disruption because you can't recreate that in-store experience online. If you look at a company like Warby Parker, it's pretty clear how that model can never scale. Warby Parker's online offering is based on a home try-on program, where customers can select five pairs of glasses that are sent to their home and can be returned free of cost. But most customers aren't buying more than one pair of glasses at a time, so that means that the majority of your inventory going out the door is just going to end up coming right back, which just isn't a sustainable use of a company's inventory after you add on shipping and customer acquisition costs. That's why in recent years we've seen Warby Parker do a 180 and actually push in-store sales by growing the number of brick-and-mortar stores that they operate. But from a shopper's perspective, if you're already going in person, why would you go to Warby Parker when you can just go to LensCrafters or Sunglass Hut where the selections of brands and styles is far greater? So in the end, all roads really do lead to Luxottica, the company that controls most points of distribution and owns the majority of the IP being funneled through those stores. Another really interesting angle to the Luxottica tale is the narrative that surrounds the relationship between Luxottica and its founder Leonardo. In many ways, the two really were one and the same. As with many founder-led companies, Leonardo saw his company as his life's work, and struggled to give up control even as the company scaled well beyond what he could have ever imagined. Even when Leonardo was well into his 70s and finally gave up his official position as CEO, Leonardo remained heavily involved in day-to-day decision-making, opting to run Luxottica through his hand-picked successor. But over time, it turned into a dynamic that was untenable for a stable of CEOs that came and went, with one even unable to make it past six weeks before calling it quits, marking the third CEO that the company had hired and lost within an 18-month period. But even during such a period of corporate turmoil, Leonardo still managed to come out on top. Because in 2016, there was a dramatic turn of events when Leonardo, at the ripe old age of 81, returned to the helm of Luxottica, albeit temporarily. His final act was to mastermind a $32 billion merger between Luxottica and another juggernaut in the industry, Essilor. The deal brought together Luxottica, the titan of luxury sunglasses with Essilor, a major player producing nearly half of the world's prescription lenses, catering mainly to budget-conscious consumers. And in a move that only Leonardo could have pulled off, he managed to finesse his way into the CEO role of the combined entity, despite the technicality that it was Essilor that had acquired Luxottica and not the other way around. And today, the company has continued its tried-and-true playbook of hostile acquisitions and vertical integration to further solidify its market dominance on a global scale. Today, Essilor Luxottica manufactures, distributes, and sells 80% of major sunglass brands around the world and 50% of prescription glasses, generating just over $25 billion in annual revenue. The truth is that buying a pair of glasses, whether they be a pair of sunglasses or prescription lenses, is going to involve Luxottica in one way or another. Attacks on consumers, hidden in plain sight.